please remain standing as we have the interreligious prayer by Dr. Terence Farah. Almighty God, giver of all good things, look with favor upon all of us gathered here this evening. Show us with your blessings of peace, love, and fellowship as we engage in this consultation with the people of Tobago West for the betterment of the lives of the people of Trinidad and Tobago through constitutional reform. And at the end of these proceedings, take each of us safely back to our homes and our families. Amen. Thank you very much. Please be seated. So we invite the representative at Shaw Park to do the official uh, safety briefing at this point. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to introduce to myself to those of you, uh, some new faces that I'm seeing in the room, definitely. I am Julian Skeet, and it is indeed my pleasure to function and to act as your moderator for this evening's session, the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, a very pivotal and indeed a critical moment in the history of our Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And as such, you know, one of the things I do very likely when I welcome persons and I start as a moderator. I do not like to talk to chairs up front. So if you will indulge me, those of you seated on this end, please join us. Please, please come forward. Please come forward. I'm seeking your kind indulgence. Mr. Bob, well, you know, I don't want to call, start calling names as I'm familiar with these faces. Please come forward. Let's occupy, let's occupy the front rows. Thank you very much as we welcome you. Each and all those persons now are running on the inside. So let's come forward. Mr. Rajman, apparently you want me to call you out by name. Come forward, come forward. Let's give him a round of applause. Let's welcome and encourage persons. We don't want to be talking to chairs up front. We've got all these seats catered to each and every one of you. And you see, when you say it long enough, people start to feel obligated to move. All right? So let's give them some encouragement to move forward. We've got seats on the front side. As I always make mention, we leave the back seats for those who might be late in class and coming in and slipping into the classroom. So once again, I want to remind each and every one of you, we are here for a very engaging session this evening. We have with us, this is the second session taking place here in Tobago, um, being noteworthy of the fact that there have been a number of sessions taking place, town hall meetings across Trinidad and Tobago to ensure that we have that public input and that opportunity to have our say as it relates to constitution reform. And therefore, at this point, I would like to invite to deliver official remarks, Chairperson of the Committee, Mr. Barindra Sinanan. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform, I am pleased to welcome you here to this, our special meeting. It is a meeting where you can share your views, ideas, and recommendations for constitution reform. The constitution, as you know, is the highest law of the land and the cornerstone of the nation's commitment to upholding fundamental human rights, ensuring social justice and public accountability, and creating a strong democratic framework to guide its future development in the interests of the welfare, prosperity, and happiness of citizens. My committee is ensuring that you, the citizens, are at the forefront and center of any reform initiative, which is why we are here today. Constitutional reform is a complex and lengthy process, not just in our country, but worldwide. We acknowledge the numerous past attempts, which only reinforce the need for our collective, persistent, and consistent civic duty for the betterment of our nation and future generations. I express my sincere gratitude for your presence here today. Your contribution is invaluable. Your voice matters, and we are here to listen. Just to give you an idea, of our mandate, <clears throat> we are required to initiate, 
consult widely and guide a national debate towards the generation of a package of ideas and opinions which will be distilled into a working document which will become the working document for the Constitution Conference to be held in June 2024. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm appealing to you today, as we did on the last occasion when we were here, your voice, the voice of Tobago matters in framing any attempt at, uh, at reforming the Constitution. So, you have an opportunity today, and I'm sure you will make use of the time to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. We can give a round of applause. All right, certainly. And I want to take the opportunity to do some formal introductions here of members of the uh, committee and committee members here with us and even those who are not present. The, con the committee constitutes a chairman of the National Advisory Committee on Constitutional Reform. And in case you are familiar with the voice that you just heard, former speaker of the House of Representatives, let's make some noise for Mr. Barindra Sinanat Essie. Certainly no stranger to us here in Tobago, Dr. Terence Farrell, attorney at law and former deputy commissioner of the Central Bank. Also joining us here this evening, Mr. Ray Sandy, former chief administrator in the Tobago House of Assembly. And I hear the voices in the mind saying, are we boy? Go ahead, you can say it out loud, all right? And we also have with us Mrs. Jackie Samson Miguel, attorney at law and the former clerk of the house. Good evening, indeed. Let me also make mention of the fact members are also who are a part of the committee, for those of you who may have been at the Tobago East meeting, we also had with us Mr. Winston Rudder, Chairman of the Public Service Commission and former permanent secretary at the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. Also a member of the committee is Mrs. Helen Drayton, former independent senator, and Ms. Hema Narain Singh, consulting managing partner of EY Caribbean. And last but certainly by no means least, also a member of the committee, Mr. Nizam Mohammed, attorney at law and former speaker of the house. So certainly a combination of skill sets and capacities rarely put together here as members of this committee leading the charge. Now one of the things I want to indicate to you, you're about to hear from the next speaker that will seek to give a background uh, into why we are here this evening and the work of this committee. But I want to indicate to you clearly that the majority of the time spent here this evening by the way in which these sessions are designed is intended to hear from you. But just before we move to that segment, allow me to welcome Dr. Terence Farrell. Thanks very much, Julian. Um, a pleasure to be here again in Tobago, uh, this time in, in Tobago West. Um, I think we're doing very well in terms of numbers. In Tobago East, we had a pretty good session uh, in Bell Garden, and so we're very happy to be here with you <coughs> in, in Tobago West this afternoon. I want to say a very special and very warm welcome to some of the young people um, who have been specially invited to this session. Uh, and just to let, to let you all know that we will be having a very special virtual session with the Tobago youth on the 8th of May. So that's going to be a special session for the young people. We're having a special set of sessions with the young people in Trinidad on the 1st and 2nd of May as well. So. It's, 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 about, it's about them, actually, <laughs> the whole constitution is really it's about them, it's about their future, it's about their country, and we want to, we want to make sure that we engage with the young people of Trinidad and Tobago on the, in this exercise. Um, <coughs> what I wanted to do by way of background is uh, to, to exercise ex is to explain uh, why we are here uh, and to point out that this committee uh, is the, the fifth attempt that Trinidad and Tobago has made at constitutional reform, the fifth attempt at constitutional reform since the 1976 constitution was put in place. And, 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 and that's not a good thing, but one of the things I say is that uh, the fact that we keep making these efforts suggests that there is a need for change. Now, the, the 1976 constitution which we have, which is our current constitution, uh, came into being as a result in part of the Wooding Constitution Commission, which Dr. Eric Williams set up and operated between 1972 and 1974. 
that commission and the report on that is available on our website along with all the other reports that are available. Uh, that, that commission's report, however, was not accepted fully by Eric Williams at the time. He only implemented certain of the recommendations of the Wooding Commission. Specifically, we moved from a governor general to a president as the head of state, and certain powers that were uh, given to the prime minister under the 62 constitution were given to the president, certain powers of appointment. But basically, the 1976 constitution, that is our current constitution, is very much the same as the 1962 independence constitution. So ladies and gentlemen, we are operating with a constitution today in 2024, which was put together hurriedly, if I may say so, in 1962 to get us to independence after the Federation broke down, when Jamaica had its referendum and opted out of the Federation. Federation broke down, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago hustled to, <coughs> to London, to Marlborough House, to become independent countries. And both countries worked very quickly to get constitutions which were handed down to us by the British. So what I'm saying to you here is that the, the institutions which a constitution sets up, the executive, the parliament, the judiciary, the other institutions, etc., are institutions which the British gave to us. We are, we are in 2024. We became independent in 1962 and a republic in 1976, and we are operating with institutions which the British gave to us in 1962. And this is the fifth occasion that we are at it, so we have not been able to make the change. But it's the fifth occasion because we have recognized every administration in this country has recognized the need for change. The NAR administration, 12 years after the Republican Constitution was put in place, set up the Hayatali Commission to do constitutional reform. That exercise was aborted by the 1990 attempted coup. And the 1990 attempted coup was a disturbance in our society reflecting certain kinds of social developments which were taking place in the society. The coup didn't just occur out of the blue. It occurred because there were certain developments taking place in society. And then the Pande administration, they didn't have an exercise on constitutional reform, but the Pande administration made some changes to some key pieces of legislation the Freedom of Information Act, the Judicial Review Act, the Integrity and Public Life Act, which revamped the Integrity Commission, all of which had constitutional implications. And then there was a group of businessmen in 2006, the Principles of Fairness Committee. This is a group of businessmen who decided that the Constitution needed changing. And they set up a committee, and they asked, and they got Taj Hossain and a couple of other senior attorneys to work on drafting a constitution for Trinidad and Tobago. And then Eric Williams, sorry, Patrick Manning, got together, uh, Ellis Clark, had consultations around the country, and Ellis Clark drafted another constitution for Trinidad and Tobago in 2009. All of these are on our website. And then the UNC People's Partnership Administration in 2013 had the Ramada Committee which did what we are doing, went around the country, had consultations, and came up with a report for constitutional reform. And what this is saying is that there is a need for reform because a lot of the problems that we are seeing, that we are witnessing in our society today, the manifestations of these problems are manifestations of institutions which are not working well. The parliament isn't working well, the judiciary is not working well, the executive, the prime minister, the cabinet, not working well. And we are seeing the effects of that in all different kinds of ways in the country. So constitutional reform, people say the exercise is a political gimmick, it's a political ploy, maybe it is, if it is that, well then that's their problem, that's not my problem. The, the issue is that this is an opportunity again 
being presented to the people of Trinidad and Tobago to, to essentially to reclaim our country. You know, a couple of days ago, I started working, looking, <laughs> on the, working on the Constitution, working on the changes that we want to put in the Constitution, and of course, I started with the preamble to the Constitution. And it struck me, five o'clock in the morning, that the, con the preamble to our Constitution is written in the third person. It is written by somebody else talking about us, whereas the people of Trinidad and Tobago, so, 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 they are talking about us. Because the preamble to the Constitution, is this, in 76 Constitution, is the same preamble we took from the 62 Constitution, which is given to us by the British, so it, it, it makes perfect sense. It is not our constitution. It is their constitution which they gave to us. And so therefore, any, any preamble that we write to the constitution now, today, has to start off with the words, we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, because it is our constitution. We have to claim it. We have to claim what it says. We have to claim back our space and what we do. So the exercise is important. The exercise is important. We want to hear your voice about what kinds of changes that we want to see. We know that there are some significant voices coming out of Tobago in respect of the kinds of reform that Tobago wants, both in terms of its relationship between Trinidad and Tobago, and then also relationships within Tobago itself. We have received, I should point out to date, I think at least 800 submissions via email from the public of Trinidad and Tobago. At 900, okay, 900 submissions, email submissions. But this is the ninth town hall meeting that we are having around the country. We have another six, five, five or six to go. And we are hearing from people what they want. We sent out a questionnaire asking people certain questions about things in the Constitution uh, and asking them what their views were on those things. And we got almost 4,000 responses to those, to those questions from people. So people are interested and people realize that this is an important exercise, it's an important moment for Trinidad and Tobago because of what is happening in our society. So grasp the opportunity, please, to have your voice, speak up, let us know what you think about, not only about the issues in relation to Tobago and Trinidad, but also the Constitution generally, and let us hear what you have to say this evening. We are here to listen. This is the last time you'll probably hear us speak for the evening. So thank you very much, and let me turn you back over to Mr. Moderator, Julian. Thank you very much there, Dr. Terence Farrell. All right. As uh, was mentioned, uh, this is basically the introduction that speaks to uh, kind of giving you an outline in relation to the framework, the committee, and therefore we proceed into the question and answer segment this evening. Now I want to indicate to you clearly, there should be no shy ones or no concern any at all that your presentations have to be formal and you have to song as, as, as if you are writing, uh, you know, uh, we just want your feedback. We just want your perspective. You, neither do you need to be sure as to whether or not it is currently in the Constitution. We want to get your perspective because ultimately I've recognized at least from uh, one of the meetings thus far, you may share a particular view that's tied to an area in the Constitution and not necessarily recognize uh, that it is. So therefore we are inviting all feedback here this evening. Now the mic is placed at the middle. You are kindly asked that before you give your contributions that members of the public, you should state your name and indicate the general area that you are coming from. All right, so before every contribution, just for the purpose of the records, you have to state your name and the general area that you're coming from. And further to that, uh, we have an indication of just about five minutes per contribution. Of course, folks, there's the possibility that we can adjust that, but that is set in the first instance to ensure that no one or two persons dominate the microphone should there be more that would want to make a contribution here this evening. All right, so those are the basic uh, guidelines going forth. And at this point, 
uh, we want to invite uh, members of the audience. Feel free to let's get started with the discussions here uh, for this evening's session. All right, so feel free to make your way to the microphone. All right, just state your name and the general area. Good evening, everybody, Mr. Chairman, members of the panel, the audience, the Begonians, fellow to Begonians, the media, everybody. I am Carol Ann Birchwood James. I don't think I'm a stranger to the Tobago people. I'm Carol Ann Birchwood James, business person, um, tourism advocate. I'll leave it at that. So, as I was telling Miss Miguel when I got in here, I had no intention to come and say anything when we think, but last week I just started writing, and so I have a few points I want to make. I have a, a seven points, and I'm going to do them as quickly as possible because I'm watching the five minutes time frame. The first point I want to talk about is the autonomy for Tobago. It's urgent. We, we need the autonomy because we need to tweak things like education. We have a national curriculum, but for a place like Tobago, you need to tweak it. You need to do some changes. We need to concentrate on innovation and invention. When we do a national scholarship, it must not only be academic, it must be skills training. We send some of our students to Germany and so on to be master joiners. We send some of our fishermen out of the North Sea and on the capital of paradise on scholarships and so on and training to be master fishermen. These are the kind of things. So we need areas where we, ha we have to tweak our education curriculum. We talk about license, license for your quarry and so on. It has to go to Trinidad. It has to spend all that wrong, wrong about time down there. And um, we are still waiting. Okay, town and country planning. Changing of election boundaries at will, 12 to 15. No input from Tobago. These are the kind of things. Report of, from, of state enterprises, airport going on, and um, we, we don't know what's going on. We, do, we don't know, because it's done by central government and so on. And the next thing is the land license. When we stopped the land license, remember we, we, did, we did not have a license, and then when Robinson came into power, he established that land license, okay? When we stopped the land license in 2008, not only we, we did we stop some type of commercial activity in Tobago, we lost our tourism business. It was directly related. It was handled badly. The message that went outside was that we did not want visitors. Meaning to say that things about Tobago and the land and so on need to be done in Tobago here. Now the sentiment wants to be changed a little bit. We should be in charge instead of having to go down to the minister. So, so I'm saying this to augment the, uh, the idea of the autonomy for Tobago, and I'm saying it is urgent. The second point I want to make is um, ref referendum. We need it. We have the talk about gun ownership. You don't talk to the population. Decriminalization of marijuana, you did not talk to the population, only certain segments. And as far as I'm concerned, that has been back, it's backfiring. Everybody is smoking everywhere, and we're going to have a big, a big problem. Okay, things like CCJ and the Privy Council, you need the public to talk about that. Reproductive rights, we need to talk about that. So you need referendum for important events that occur, you need what the people have to say, like how we have it in some of those other Caribbean islands. Term limits, two terms. Your prime minister, president, chief secretary, that kind of thing, two terms, I think is enough. I know I'm repeating some of what the other people say, but I think, you know, it, that's enough. I, um, I believe in first past the post. I do not believe in too much of this proportional representation, and I'll say why. Because of our, the construct of our population with the different races and so on, we're gonna have to be very careful with that. I know that in the local government, they have introduced some part of proportional representation, but 
And so that is good, yes, in a way. Maybe the Tobago House of Assembly might need to do some of that, but we have to be very careful with that um, harmony of the races and the numbers that of people and um, that proportional representation. My next point, my fifth point, I say yes to the Privy Council and no to the CCG at this time. I want to recommend, and I'm aware, Mr. Farrell, that you did a re research on the, um, opinion, um, the opinions of the CCJ as, com no, 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 the opinions of our local courts. Am I getting it right? The opinions of our local courts versus um, the Privy Council. I'm also aware, in doing my little research, thing I didn't want to write about, that Reginald Am Amor also did a paper on that. But here's what. If I wasn't doing this, I would have never known that there was a paper. There were two people who wrote papers on it. It means then that you need more people to write about it. You need more independent people to also write their opinion about the, the two different courts, the local courts and the Privy Council. You need, if you want, if you, you think that you really need, when we reach a stage for the CCJ, then you need some more education to, the, um, to your, your population. Okay, so you cannot really just, your papers are done, and it's only because um, I'm telling my daughter, and she said, she pulled it up and said, Mommy, look, I have these two here. And I would have never known. So that, that's, that's a point for you, uh, uh, Mr. Farrell. Right? And um, fixed dates for elections. The idea, our society has evolved. We have over 24% of people, yes, I know my five minutes going, right, I'm nearly finished. Uh, who are tertiary educated. And therefore, the idea of having um, your election date in your back pocket is no more. You need to have fixed dates. We know what we are, we are doing. And my last point, I'm, leaving, I'm winding up now, review of election finance laws. We need to have more teeth in them. I know there are laws there, but we need to more have teeth in them. It cannot be who have more corn feed more fowl. Okay, so that's my contribution. Thank you very much for listening to me. All right, thank you very much for leading, leading the way indeed, and we inviting the next person to come to the microphone. Now just please be reminded folks, it doesn't mean you may only have one chance to speak, so even if you speak in the first instance for five minutes, we do that wrong in terms of going around the room, you will have an opportunity to come back to the microphone accordingly. All right, so we move on to, uh, all right, please proceed. Good evening, members of the panel, head table. Tobagonians, good evening. My name is Mr. Tory Benjamin, better known as Mr. Smooth. I have one concern. The concern I have is what would it take to have the history of Tobago being taught in our schools? Tobago have a history, and I believe firmly that if the history of Tobago ought, ought to be taught in our schools, then we find that a lot of misconception about boundaries and all this kind of stuff would, would be cleared in our minds in the population. We have young generations coming up doesn't even know how Government House Road got its name. Tobago had its own flag. It used to be Tobago and Trinidad. Red, green, and black. The governor was governed along. There are a lot of history that our younger generation, so many different countries have fought for this island, to give us the little breathing space that we have today. And yet, most of the young generations growing up here, they, they went to school, they go in America, you have to learn some American history. You, you're from Tobago, and you have no history of this island being taught in our schools. What would it take? What would it take? 
that's all for this afternoon. Thank you very much. All right, so we continue with the conversation. We're inviting persons, feel free to come forward to the microphone with your contribution. Hi, good day. My name is Earth Lazama. I'm from Calder Hall, and I'm representing Hair Tobago Pride, which is an NGO that represents LGBTQI Tobagonians and allies. I want to talk about the issue of protection, which we currently lack under the Equal Opportunity Act. Um, it is not just LGBTQI citizens, it's also citizens with disabilities and as in terms of age. Um, currently, we, those facing discrimination because of age, because of any health condition, um, or because they are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or intersex are not accommodated by the equal opportunity machinery, which means we can still be discriminated in terms of employment, housing, education, access to goods and services such as healthcare. And given that we are citizens of this country like any other, we think that we should have the same human rights that everyone has and protection. I think it's some, a constitutional issue. Um, and that's why I want to say, yeah. Right, thank you very much there. So we're inviting persons, feel free to come forward to the microphone to make your contribution. Remember, you can just give your comments, give your perspective, uh, probably put forward a question. It's totally up to you. While we wait for the next person to come forward to the microphone, let me take this opportunity to recognize here with us this evening uh, a young man who I continue to be very proud of, uh, doing exceptional and excellent work representing us here in Tobago and beyond. President of the Tobago Youth Council, Mr. Darian Mitchell. And it's also a good opportunity for me to put that reminder out there that on the 8th of May, that there will be a session targeting our young persons in particular, and that's gonna be in collaboration with the Tobago Youth Council being hosted as one of those efforts to continue to seek the views, opinions, and perspectives of citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. So at this point, we continue to invite in this open segment. Feel free to come forward to the microphone to make your contribution. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ariane Amata from Mount Grace. Um, so I just want to second some of the stuff that Earth said in regards to, I do believe that the government should make explicit the protections of queer citizens across the board. I want to talk about um, disability rights in the sense of, in a lot of places, it's not very like, physically accessible for people with disabilities, so people who need crutches, or people who are in wheelchairs, or people who just have reduced the mobility. I also want to talk about um, Tobago's uh, need to maintain its ownership of its beaches, its forests, its hills, its trails, like any hiking places like that, because very recently, I ran into some activists who were talking about Save Rocky Point, I believe I'm getting that right, Be um, which is where um, lots of surfers like to use by Anchor Bar and Grill, Mount Irving. And apparently, like, private individuals want to buy that land and repurpose it for things like that. And so I do believe Tobago at all points in time should maintain its ownership of its beaches. I know lots of, Carib there are a couple of Caribbean islands where companies can buy up the beaches and the public can't enjoy the public, well, the public beaches. And I believe we should always be able to access our beaches. And, okay, that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the contribution. And we continue this evening, inviting you to come forward to the microphone. Good afternoon. This is not my area of expertise, so if I sound like I don't know what I'm talking about, please forgive me. But there are two points that I would like to make. I would like to see Karen Bart Alexander. I would like to see the Constitution supersede and do away with those laws that allow people to steal land. You see, those laws that allow people to steal land adverse 
possession of land, I think it should be done away with via a constitutional something. I don't know if, it's, if that's possible, if it's not possible, but this is my idea of what I would like to see in the Constitution because we can't be telling people don't steal and the law provides for people to steal land. And that is how it is in Trinidad and Tobago. The other thing is, let me see if I could remember what the other thing was. The stealing of land, and there was one other thing on my mind when I came to the microphone, and right now I cannot really remember it, but I will sit down, I'll remember it, and I'll come back. Is that all right? Thank you. Totally okay, totally okay. I think we should give her a round of applause, you know. Because, you know, in a different circumstance, the individual might have just kept talking and going on and on and rambling uh, and not giving an opportunity for another to come meanwhile. So, yes, you are free to return uh, to the microphone. And just a reminder for those who may have entered the room uh, a little late before the initial announcement, when you come to the microphone, you're just required to state your name and to indicate your general area for the purpose of the recording and then continue to make your contribution. Uh, we have estimated an average of about five minutes per contribution when by the time we've gone around the room, you'll have an opportunity to come back a second time around. All right? So feel free to proceed. Uh, good evening. My name is Rodney Piggott, uh, just a community activist. I have first a question. Uh, this morning, I heard a conversation. I think it was this gentleman, and he was on Tobago Updates, and he made a statement, and I want to make sure I got that statement correct. He, he said that the Constitution is a colonial instrument, a colonial creature. That's what I thought. He didn't use the word creature, but uh, implying you're shaking your head. I don't know which one of you it was. I mean, you look like him. <laughs> <All right. laughs> no, you guys don't look the same. <laughs> right? The, the, the Constitution is a colonial creature. So my question to you, I don't know if you want to answer it now or just jot it down for you all to answer later, is that if the Constitution is a colonial creature, are you saying that the style of government that we currently have is a colonial creature? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So having recognized that, <laughs> What then should we do about that? Are we still <laughs> under colonial rule? And if we're not, why are we still saddled with a, uh, a colonial government, all right? So is reforming the Constitution uh, and not reforming the style of government we have, <laughs> I mean, does that really work out, all right? So if we have a new Constitution that is not colonial, but we have a style of government that is colonial, have we really done anything? That's my question to you. My next point is, in, in speaking of, um, uh, well, we all know Tobago's autonomy has been bantered about. Um, uh, some speak of it as self-determination. Uh, but to me, self-determination is not something someone gives you or even asks someone for, all right? Self-determination is I determine myself. <laughs> I don't need your permission to do that. So when we talk about this autonomy, this greater autonomy, and uh, we're talking about um, what's a big deal is the definition of Tobago, right? The boundaries of Tobago. In our recent iteration of this push, um, Tobago was given uh, an opportunity to have its own government, the island government of Tobago. Well, if Trinidad does not have its own island government, doesn't that mean that central government defaults as the government of Trinidad? So how can central government be the government of Trinidad and then the government of Trinidad and Tobago at the same time? It would seem to me then that if we're going to partition Tobago off and say, okay, you govern yourself, you have your own government here, you have to do the same thing to Trinidad. And then the central government now sits over both of those, whether it's a federal system or my friend Anthony here talks about a confederate system, but it has to be one in which both parties are equal, right? Not Tobago having its own government, Trinidad not having its own government. Well, who governs Trinidad then? Central government. So that's a problem there, right? So those are my points. 
Thank you very much indeed. I remembered what I was coming to say. Don't forget to state the name and to I start. Karen for the Bart Alexander. And I remembered it even before Rodney spoke, but I'm so happy for Rodney's contribution because what I was coming to say is that our system of government is not working for us. And it doesn't take, you know, rocket science to work that out. It is just not working. And if we have to reform the Constitution, we need to have a new system of government that works for us. We need to have a management team in Trinidad and Tobago running Trinidad and Tobago. We need to have an oversight committee or Senate that is going to oversee, monitor, evaluate, and mediate with the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So we, we, we need to put in place something different because right now, it is aggravating and annoying to listen to the government and the opposition. They carry on and they get on and they, you know, and it is not working for development. We're not moving forward. This country is at a standstill and going down. We're not heading up. And one of the re main reasons is because of our governance system that is finding its way into all of our activities. What is happening at the level of government and that kind of toxicity is what is causing all the murders and all the mayhem and everything that is going on in the country because it is absolutely poisonous. Thank you. All right, inviting the views and opinions of all here. I suspect you meant it is, you suspect it is that or you, or you know it for a fact. <laughs> all right, so we continue with the contributions here this evening. Yes, um, blissful greetings to everyone. I am Highest Imperial Majesty, Goddess MD Trinity L, that is my appellation in a natural form. Other persons know me by my other strawman name, which is Tanika Mahabal. I am here on behalf of the royal family of Alubera, Alubera being the name of Tobago, before it was actually signed to the Republic by the uh, Commonwealth. I'm not sure if any person or any other being here has information of that as well as do Trinidad has the name Karirianni before it was actually Trinidad and Tobago when it was signed by the Commonwealth when the Queen has been here. So it is just a part of history. So to contribute to what my fellow royal brother, Rude One, had mentioned pertaining to the state of the, um, the fundamental that is governing us, democracy to me has already served its time. I have a, a personal, um, aspiration to prefer to solve rather than to regurgitate the same flaws that doesn't work for me or for anything else when it comes to actually moving ahead in something that is actually going to be better and work for us. So with that I have actually did some studies and I have formulated a case study thesis that can or should perhaps solve the re reoccurring issue that we have always had conversation about. So as I know democracy, the, uh, democracy has also been built on the fundamentals of capitalism and socialism merged together combined has formulated this um, political system known as democracy. So in order for it to work, democracy is not really a, pro a progressive rejuvenator of royal order in service management as it deprives many natural governing principles since it leans too much into pure socialism or either pure capitalism strains. And we see this through the political scope over time with the partisan agenda and even how things are set up in the constitution. So it doesn't really work for us. So what in a sense occurs, it is like a battle between colonialism and communism. So it's to lean away from that right now because uh, it has served its time. And what I have written further as an answer, as a solution, when it comes to a thesis, is what I call Trinitarian order. Well, first, it was called commune democratialism, which is, a, which is a merge of only the strengths from communism, the strengths from socialism, the strengths of whatever it is there is in democracy. And I combined the strengths from these three things. I just merged it into one system thesis. Allow me a couple minutes to just read it briefly to everyone so that they can actually have an idea of my thesis case study. 
So the Trinitarian order is an ethical and theoretical function that creates the order to which governance of leadership is established within and amongst the divine law and spirit of the natural government of the highest council, where sovereignty and spirit of divine natural governance is responsible for the control, honor, order, respect, and discipline in justice and harmony of equal and equitable growth between self and nation. This is the divine motion of recharging infinite constant growth in synchronized functionability of a non-pure socialist or pure capitalist and communist style governing of corporate states and divine natural government. This is a fundamental created in the source root of equitable oneness where the versatility of sovereign individuals and their collective growth is neither deprived nor abused by any of the hired corporate state body or offices, its members, or any other divine natural govern mem mem government members, all right? So, so to say is that the jurisdiction of governance, being self-governance, as self refers to the individual per se, we must be able to get to that point of self-mastery where whatsoever we do or decide on has to be merged and be in synchronity and harmony towards balance where everyone in the room should be able to have some kind of equitable justice. It shouldn't be one-sided or socialist as some would have it through the scope of fascism, nepotism, and these other isms, but rather to break free from that and come to an agreement where we are able to work in a flow where it does not neglect or deprive the actual public who are the ones who, are, who vote and place persons into power and um, have them ignored when it comes to the fundamentals of whatsoever it is going on. And to further contribute to what my fellow royal sister, yeah, I can't remember, I can't remember her name, when it comes to the aspect of land, to me, from my understanding, your birthright is one of the highest jurisdiction. So anyone being born on the soil that they are living on has that jurisdiction both right to occupy and secure the parcel of land that they are born on because of that birth right. So there is no such thing as stealing lands when you have that birth right. You are here through your mother's birth passage naturally and you will live here in mother nature as the natural order which is um, in the jurisdiction of the natural law which is also the common law. Right, so it is to also correct that. Another thing in the Constitution I would like to question is where it mentions the right to life. I am alive, so why would I need a right to life when I'm, in li I'm alive in the breath, in living form? So that as well needs to be corrected and also be solved when it comes to what is written and being mentioned and not misleading persons to think that they are not worthy of standing in their sovereign diplomacy and operate in the jurisdiction of objecting legitimately against that which doesn't serve us well. So in my conclusion, I would say democracy has really served its time, rightfully, and it's for us to do the research, do the case studies, and begin solving for better so that we could actually not just preserve but protect the livelihood and the wealth restoration when it comes to no longer repeating the cycle of colonialism that would continue to collapse us all. We speak futuristically, yet we still repeat the same redundant flaws in order to protect a name or an image that is just empty to the actual nation and country. So first, we must know self and who we are in the form of identity. When it comes to self-governance and self-autonomy, no one can hand it to us, but we must assume that jurisdiction within ourselves and do such. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much there for the contribution this evening. And we continue. Good evening, everyone. Um, Birian Mitchell, Tobago Youth Council President. Um, in 2020, approximately 40% of the national population would have been constituted as youth, right? So now when we look at our constitution, the constitution does not have provisions for guaranteed youth representation in decision-making bodies such as parliament, local councils, or advisory committees. 
This lack of representation limits the ability of young persons to have their voices heard. Now, they do invite us to consultations, but I noticed two weeks before a consultation is not a formal invitation. If you are going to get married, I'm sure the invitations will go out at least three months in advance. So why is it when youths are being considered, we are considered two to five weeks before or two to three days before the consultation? That does not provide us with ample time to prepare or to have anything to say per se because when we now come into the room, we have limited information. You could go ahead. I was seeing the expressions on your face, so you could go ahead. May I, Mr. Moderator? Good afternoon, everyone. It's on. Are you hearing me? You know, that is not um, the impression we sought to give. Actually, we have been talking about the exchange of ideas and constitutional reform since February. Um, we have been inviting submissions and we have been educating persons via our website. And so at this time, all our formal invitations for oral submissions and oral interactions would be, it would appear to be um, short. And that is only because we were of the view that all along persons were thinking about this thing, um, would have been exercising their minds. <laughs> Constitutional reform is not new. And indeed, most of the persons who have spoken to us before have been thinking about these things for some time. So when we reached out to have formal discussions, uh, the same thing we did with the Trinidad Youth Council at the time when we realized, look, we were not able to find particular and dedicated space at these forums for the youth, nor for the elderly, nor for the disabled. We felt, look, because the future belongs to the youth, we should carve out a dedicated time for the youth. And this is why we said to the Tobago Youth Council and the Trinidad Youth Council, let's chat. Um, so I'm sorry if you felt that it was just a two week notice for a meeting, but for us, the notice was given since February to come forward with your views and your ideas. We have decided to carve out a dedicated time for the demographic called youth because we consider you to be special. So I'm sorry that you took offense, but no offense was intended. No. Okay. Thank you very much <laughs> for that. But the email, the formal invitation was received on the 16th, which was last week. Now I understand what you're saying with the online platform. Now that does not mean that there's equity amongst those who don't have internet. So by providing something online for someone who does not have a smart device or may not have uh, that level of access to internet, where does that leave those persons? So consideration for all around the island should be made. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we continue. Good day, everyone. My name is Amanda Francis from Spring Garden. So my contribution today would be pertaining to women and young girls. Um, with Internet and Tobago, we have had a large amount of violence against women and young girls. Um, the lady and her mother who was killed by a serviceman in Trinidad, a young girl who was beheaded in a very gruesome manner. Um, I think that a lot is not being done, and I really think that there needs to be more looked at in terms of how women and issues pertaining to women and young girls are dealt with. Even something as simple as a woman wanting to tie her tubes, she has to get permission from her husband. I don't know what day and age we're living in, where that should still be going about, but I think that discussions between into women and young girls need to also be had by women and young girls. Even when you look at the panel, it's majority men, and I am not saying that you all are not supposed to be there, but there's a lot of unequalness, if that's even a word, pertaining to the discussions being had. Um, 
And if we are to move to a society where women are able to then hold these positions and have these conversations, we need to start with how they are being dealt with from the in school, why it is. We want to pull the young girls aside and I'm like, oh, your period. We all have our period as women, right? So I don't see why you want to have the children, the young girls have the conversation and the boys in another corner. That has to stop. So that's my contribution. Thank you, thank you very much. Hi, good evening everyone. I am Shaq Yujan from Providence, intending all is well. And my contribution this evening would be mainly on employment and fair labor practices. All right, so I would like to highlight the importance of enforcing fair labor practices to ensure that employees are treated equitably and their rights are protected, right? Um, I'm fairly young, however, I've noticed that there's a significant amount of exploitation occurring in Tobago, whether it's from small businesses or large companies. One of the primary reasons for this is that employers often target individuals who lack knowledge of fair labor practices, and these employers use bullying tactics and they basically force employees into complying with their demands, exploiting their vulnerable positions, and threatening job loss. So it's basically, I got your job. When the employees do muster up the courage to stand up for their rights, or question the legality or the appropriateness of the, the certain procedures, employers often perceive this as disrespectful or insubordination. I would really love if a greater conversation could be held and we target more youths. I would say most of the ones who is coming out of school because what I've noticed as well, most establishments or companies, they would be like, oh, we want the youths. The youths' minds are fresh. But I think there's a preconceived notion behind that as well because they know the youths doesn't, they don't have that much knowledge on fair labor practices. So they think they would be able to get away with some of the stuff that they do. So I strongly advocate that the reinforcement of worker protection laws so that we can prevent exploitation in the future. This includes implementing regulations on working hours, ensuring overtime pay, and prioritizing workplace safety. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. And you'll forgive me, but if you know the name Julian Skeet any at all, I'm a very strong advocate for youth and community development, and I'm just very pleased to see my young persons contributing here this evening. So give them an extra round of applause. That's no offense intended uh, to those who are more experienced in our field. Good day. My name is Earth Lazama from Calder Hall. Um, I want to make a note about environmental rights, specifically the right to a sustainable and healthy environment for all. I think this would be an issue of a special concern for the youth, especially as we are inheriting this island and this country. Um, climate change is something that is of major concern for us. And as, the, as in the Caribbean, we produce less than 1% of emissions. So it's less necessarily about our emissions, but how are we going to deal with climate change? Huge emitters like the US and Western countries are continuing down the path. And they seem to not care about the consequences, but we are the ones who are going to deal with it first. We're going to deal with the sea level rise, with the rise in heat, with seeing our crops die off, with seeing change in weather patterns, and it will hurt us the most. Um, I don't see, and I think a lot of young people feel that we don't see the government doing anything or caring about it. And I think climate change adaption is something we should pay attention to. I have gone around asking all the elders in my life, is it getting hotter? Because just to me, in the past two, three years, I have traveling has become harder and harder and harder. And I have asked the elders in my life and they have said, yeah, when I was young, it wasn't this hot. There were more trees, it wasn't this hot. You know, traveling wasn't as hard. And I think while we may not be able to change the fact that it's getting hotter, there are things we can do about it. We, and if we recognize that we all have the right to a sustainable environment, I think we would give more attention to that. Um, also, I think the youth are less concerned about upholding traditional ways of being. Um, for example, last year, last summer, and it will probably happen again this summer, we had record-breaking 
heat. The Ministry of Health told us we should try to avoid being outside between the hours of nine and three, which is peak hours to be outside. Um, people were suffering, um, traveling in the heat, not having places to um, shelter. Um, I, I constantly saw people working construction sites at peak, peak um, heat hours. I don't think we should continue down this path because that's the way it's always done. I'm not saying I know what climate adaption looks like, but I think if we consider that is a fundamental right that everyone has and we are creative about our solutions, we can think of a better world. Um, so I think that's of specific concern. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, so we continue with the contributions. Hello, good evening. My name is Melissa James Guy, and the general area that I represent is Plymouth. This evening, I would like to make a contribution on the appointment of the police commissioner and how I think that um, we could make some changes to that in the Constitution. Um, I'm of the belief that the current process for the appointment of a police commissioner is complex, is convoluted, and most likely costly, and it also does not allow for the full confidence of the population because um, I guess the Police Service Commission could somehow see it as, the Police Service Commission can somehow be seen as a rubber stamp because as the current process goes, the commission has to send the nominations to the president, it has to come down from her to the House of Representatives, Parliament has to be convened for a debate to happen, whether it be for a substantive appointment or even for an acting appointment. And uh, because of our style of governance that some of um, our Tobagonians here have also indicated is pretty much outdated, where we have the majority rules, it could pretty much be considered political interference to some extent dependent on how the entire process goes. So my recommendation would be that the Police Service Commission, or if we decide to give away with service commissions on a whole after this entire process, whichever body that responsibility is vested in, that they should be the final decision makers with regards to who would be appointed as a police service commissioner, as well as um, we must also leave some space for the prime minister and the leader of the opposition to just be able to send a non-objection. And if they do object, it must be substantiated with evidence and you know good reasoning as to why um, they have an objection to this this nomination or to this appointment, and I guess that could be considered by the service commission, or maybe not, but at the end of the day, um, we have to get rid of that bureaucratic process, convoluted way it allows for some political interference, if we, if we have to be honest, because it, it, it's definitely not auguring well for us as a society where um, we are riddled with crime, and I think that we have to deal with it from the root, and the appointment of our commissioner of police is definitely a good place for us to start to ensure that we separate the powers of the state and the police service. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I see persons raising hands. Just feel free to come forward to the microphone. Again, for the benefit of those who walked in the room afterwards, you can feel free to come across to the microphone for your contribution. Just feel free to indicate your name before the start of your contribution and the general area that you're coming from. So no need to raise hands. You can come straight to the microphone. If you want us to give way for you to sit to make that contribution, Mr. Bob, are you good? No, I'm not that. All right, good. I'm just making sure. I'm not that invalid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, good night, everybody. Good, Mr. Chairman, everybody. My name is George Bob. 
I am from New Orleans. I really want to start with a negative note, really. <laughs> I want to disagree with Dr. Farrell about the imposition of the colonial constitution in Trinidad and Tobago. If you listen to Eric Williams throughout the years, he would say that it's the best thing after sliced bread in terms of the constitution. Of it. So that is the thing that he, he himself helped to move and bring down to us. So it's not something imposed upon us. It's something that Eric Williams carved out for himself. As a matter of fact, this even went, I uh, was extended to the, the wooden condition, um, to the wooden commission that Eric Williams described as a dagger to the heart of the PNM. So <laughs> I just wanted to start with that and to make that correction. <laughs> um, additionally, I think that I really think that how this thing rolled out is just rolled out badly. I could remember well sometimes in Canada some years ago, they were doing something with respect to their constitution. And they, well, let's say Canada has about what, 40 or 50 million people. They had people throughout the, the communities educating people, at least 40,000 people doing that. I'm saying in Trinidad and Tobago, to have done that, what you should have had in terms of population to population, you should have had at least about 1,000 people throughout the country, mobilizing people, educating people. Because a lot of people in our country, especially the man in the street, he doesn't, he's not interested in the Constitution. He's told and therefore learned that the Constitution is for people like Dr. Farrell and so on and so forth, you know. Um, you know. And um, so therefore, this learned helplessness that sh you should have education, educating the people to bring them out, to get them, because they think that the Constitution really did, it doesn't deal with their bread and butter, really. So I'm saying, and this is why I'm saying, I have doubts about the outcome of the, the, the thing of this community. Even the opposition is not part of this process. And you need the opposition. If this constitution reform has to be completed, you need the opposition support in parliament. But even the opposition is, is, is not here. Let us look at the Tobago issue. Ho Choi Tan that died at um, the end of last year. The, the, we were told that the Tobago bills will come into, um, brought back into the parliament before the end of 2024. Then out of the blues, you heard about this new constitutional reform thing. Now where does the Tobago situation, where is the Tobago situation? So I could, I think it could be um, best described as what William, um, Winston Churchill would say, it's a riddle inside a mystery, inside an enigma. You know, this is where the, the Tobago situation finds itself, right? So therefore, I am in the position, even the Constitution Commission, I'm not too sure you know what your role is. There are some people, when you look at the, the words of the Prime Minister, he's talking about constitutional amendment. When you look at the literature, uh, your literature, you talk about constitutional reform. Now, are they the same thing? I'm not too sure, really. It's other people are talking about constitution replacement. Now, tell me where you are in this. You know, it's a, it's a puzzle, and if it's a puzzle for you, and you, and you, what about the people out there? You know, so, I, so I'm saying, I am going to make my contribution tonight, but I make a distinction between hope and optimism. I'm, I'm not optimistic that this thing would be successful. I'm only hopeful, <laughs> really. 
<laughs> okay, I'm only hopeful. I'm saying, okay, so let us look at the Tobago situation. I think basically, okay, the, the Constitution. I think Constitution reform, particularly in Trinidad and Tobago, needed right now. I think it's really, really needed because the two constitutions that we, we've had, 72 and 76, the key issues that were not addressed in those constitutions. One is the plural nature of the country. Of course, we have heard some of our political scholars talking about Trinidad and Tobago. You have um, three halves make a whole in terms of the sociological makeup of Trinidad and Tobago. You heard about the several tribes that we have six and so, but they have not been represented in terms of, uh, of the, the constitution that we have at this particular point in time. We also need to move from maximum leadership to maximum participation. In terms of right now, we have this maximum leadership, all power in the hands of a prime minister and so on. So you have maximum leadership, personal power, central domination, and one man rule. We must move away from that. We have also to have representative government. Right now, what we have is elective government. We elect as other people, but they are not representative. Okay? And citizens are supposed to be involved in the process because people think it's. So, in terms of the Trinidad and Tobago, I think we need a, a federal government. It is the first time since the union between Trinidad and Tobago. This is the only kind of framework within the union and Trinidad and Tobago that we could walk side by side, not one behind the other. And that was the mantra of one of our leaders, and I think it still stands today, that a federal setup would help our situation. With respect to the Tobago situation, the irreducible minimum, and I'm talking now what you might call the irreducible minimum, should be half of the capital of Trinidad and Tobago should be in Scarborough and the other half in Port of Spain. Um, so Tobago must have the power to make laws and to run its own affairs. Tobago must be in control of its natural resources. Tobago must have the authority to engage with parties in bilateral and multilateral negotiations and agreements and so on. And the Tobago must have negative resolution in any legislation that seriously affects Tobago. Other proposals I want to make is that I think the country, with respect to the, should, um, the country as a whole, et cetera, should we, we should have a presidential form of government. I think uh, Ellis Clark would support me on this. If you look at his reading, he would support me on this. That's, that means the executive, the head of state and head of government is one and the same person. He's not part of, but outside the legislature. The president is elected separately from this legislature and he or she will have no control over it. But the legislature will have considerable con control over him. The legislature would be able to summon anyone including the head of state to, to account for his stewardship and so on. Generally, there are lots of other supporting things which is for the presidential nature of the thing. Um, members, of the uh, members of the government cabinet chosen by the executive could not be members of the legislature. If an elected member of the legislature is chosen as a cabinet member, he or she must resign his seat. This allows the country to be best served by the finest mind at cabinet level, as it is the prerogative of the executive to select true and trusted members of society outstanding their in their respective field from the community at large. No executive must be given more than two consecutive terms. Additionally, he must have crossed 
ethnic appeal through provision that the person elected must, that the person who is elected as president, that person elected must gain significantly more than 50% of the votes cast. The candidate coming second in the presidential election automatically becomes speaker of the, the legislature. In terms of the legislature, should be unilateral. Should, should be unicameral. Uh, we have, I know, <laughs> time is coming to, I know you could look at, at New Zealand in this respect, and I know I would have the support of Wooden and Clark on this. Uh, <laughs> no. When I come back. All right, there, excellent. So he, he, he understands the assignment. So it's not a matter of extending. This is not the parliament. We want to give a fair view so you'll have an opportunity to come back as we go around the room. All right? So we continue with the contributions. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the name is Barry Jofield, uh, Scarborough. Um, you know, there's a saying in Tobago, plain talk. Sometimes it's bad manners, but sometimes it's good to have bad manners too. Um, the truth be told, I wanted to follow up on two points that were made. Um, the young person who mentioned the, the fact that youths weren't represented, uh, the young lady who suggested that ladies weren't represented. And I want to just start off by saying a bad process could never have a good outcome. The only time that happens is if it's an accident. And the process to do this thing is bad. And therefore, the outcome can't be good. If it comes out good, it could only be by accident. Um, so I want to start off there. Um, you know, again, plain talk bad manners. I think if I could dra draw a, a line between going from Mr. Sinanan to Dr. Farrell to Mr. Sandy. I don't know what, what the lady's name though. I, I could kind of draw a, a p and line and we could interpret it in that kind of way. Okay, in the context of Mr. Farrell, you were in charge of the National Advisory Board. Um, selected, I, I'm just talking about appearance of the process. Mr. Sinanan, you were Speaker of the House. Again, the process, the interpretation of it. Uh, well, Mr. Sandy, you administrator on the PNM government. I could start to draw the line that says maybe it is. All right, good. But the point I'm making is, the point I'm making is, if you have a process that appears to be streamlined in a particular way, and then people like myself would want to think that it's a process that is geared in a particular kind of way. And I think I heard from the previous session where Mr. Farrell, you were saying basically, look, you're not sure where this thing is going after. So you're going to do your part of it and the rest will be done. If it was a process directed to have a particular outcome, you should have said, okay, after you're done here, it's going to go there, then finally we're going to end up with something that is going to be an outcome. There is no dotted line to the outcome. So I could only think this is a, a ruse at some political time to make us feel, especially that, you know, something is going to be done. And Mr. Farrell, you mentioned, I think from the last one, that it was done five times. Why this can't be the sixth time? You know, we had it for the local government. We have it for the Tobago bills. Why can't we have it with this one? It's just a process. One of the major points I want to make is there's no way in the world a dictator with dictator power seeds that power without people forcing them to do it. This is not going to happen. The prime minister has dictatorial power. He's not going to see that to us by us talking here about it. Hello. We in the room, we had to do something different 
to get the government to change the system. Otherwise, it's not going to happen at all. It's going to be number six, seven, eight. It's not going to happen, trust me. The Prime Minister could select or influence the selection of all the independent commissions. Which Prime Minister is going to do that? Decide that he's going to see his power to select police commissioner, industrial court, etc., etc., service commission. Which Prime Minister is going to do that? You know, we have to wake up to understand that it's not going to happen. This report is not going to go anywhere. We have to do something different, people, to get this thing done. Um, I want to go, go back to why I don't think it will happen either. I, I think the Prime Minister says he's the longest serving, he's the longest serving representative. So he's the longest serving that has seen this constitution work. He knows how it works. Why at this stage is he going to finally decide that? A thing that gave him all that power is going to see the us. It's not going to happen. Um, I just want to quickly go to a few points of the concern. We need to have an elected president. Like in the Singapore Constitution, where the elected president, the president is elected, the president elects the boards, the president elects the commissions, prime minister, and they have nothing to do with that. You have true independence. So the prime minister can't can walk into the president's office and pick up the commissioner's document and walk out with it. Yeah? Or you can't have the integrity commission. Yeah? An integrity commission situation where the integrity commission takes the prime minister to court. And then you have the president appointing a new, hello, in an independent commission, and they squash the matter immediately. Oh, how does that work in terms of a democracy? Will he see that power? No, it wouldn't happen. And qualifications of a president. In this case, we're going to separate them. You have, in the Singapore constitution, the president has to have qualifications. It's not just being selected as a president. You can either come from the private stream or you could come from the public stream. And they're clear in terms of what your qualifications are. You don't just wake up one morning, become a president. So if you're in the private stream, you have to be private sector performing. Your company had to be profitable before they even think about. So maybe if we had that, maybe like Arthur Lokjak might have been the president or maybe Anthony Sabga or something like that. But we would probably have a better president if that was the case. And proportional representation. We need proportional representation because we saw it from the ONR, we saw it from NAR, we saw it from COP. And people are disenfranchised when we not take all. Everybody else takes none. In fact, in the Singapore Constitution, the president is selected over time by the, the marginalized group is allowed to select the president, I think it's every five years or so, so that they have an opportunity to select a president. So Tobago might be able to select a president within a 25 year period or something like that or within whatever period it is, but you can consult the constitution for that. And finally, you know, capital punishment. You know, like in, you know, I like the Singapore model. Now, we say capital punishment doesn't work. But in the Singapore model, they have capital punishment for gun crimes. They have capital punishment for terrorism. They have capital punishment for drugs. And drugs fuels crime. And you know, it's time enough that we decide that, you know, those things become removed from society in a way that, that you do it. Um, and I think we need to look at capital punishment. I think after Ramis Lawrence Maraj did it, you know, crime stepped back a bit. And I think, you know, that's my contribution for this afternoon. I'd probably come back if 
there's the opportunity to. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. Uh, while the other person comes to the microphone, we want to indicate very quickly if the driver of PDP 137 is in the room. PDP 137, please report to your vehicle immediately. All right, your vehicle is on. All right, so please report to your vehicle immediately, PDP 137, and we continue with the contributions. So, good evening, everyone. Greetings to the head table, especially my friend, Jackie Sampson. So good to see you. Uh, people of Tobago. You know, if we, so, oh, I'm sorry, Denise Sawyer Fat Angus, Monk Turvin, and political leader of the Innovative Democratic Alliance. And thank you, Dr. Farrell, for your description of the history of the five different times that were failed in terms of going forward. And perhaps if it's the first thing we need to do inside of changing this constitution is to set exactly the way that this constitution can be changed. Because the format in which this was done is doomed to fail. Why do I say that? Because we did not hear that it was something that came out of parliament. Parliament where you have both the opposition and those in government. And therefore, if you have a committee like this coming out of parliament, you would then have teeth. You would know that what you're doing is not in vain. You will know that what you're doing is not waiting for it to get back to parliament for opposition to say, well, you all didn't con you consult with us, and therefore, how come you're coming to us now? Everyone knows that there should be a three-fifths majority, I mean a two-thirds majority in terms of getting this done. And therefore, if you're not prepared to consult with the very people you would need to get it done, what are you saying? Are you really serious that this is going anywhere? You can't tell me that you didn't know or you didn't remember or you didn't understand because that would send some serious you know, ideas of incompetence. But when you think about the other side, you ask yourself, is this just another political gimmick because elections are around the corner? I have been on the, going through the communities with Dr. Vanus James, and I know that if this is a political gimmick, gimmick, it's going to be one of the largest blunders of this administration. Because these communities are very clear about what they want. They want to be empowered. They feel that they should be able to manage their resources in their communities because right now they are not being served adequately. And so these communities are clamoring for a small budget. A small budget that they can decide what are their priorities in their communities. Whether they want to send a young man to, 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 to go on a sports scholarship because we heard uh, in Canaan that there's a young man there who is even better than Dwight York. But one administration decided that they would not give support for the man, young man to go off on a scholarship. And they said, if we had our budget, we can send that person on. We can choose to decide that that is our priority so to do. They also want to know that they can put on their own festivals and they don't have to go to any administration to beg for money to put on a festival. And a festival that can have serious returns for them. They want to know that they can light their own playing fields. Hope has been without lights for so many years. And it's one of the most used um, football fields uh, in, in the island. 
So these communities are clamoring to be empowered through having their own budget, and they would love to have it seen, guaranteed in the Constitution. They also want to have, uh, to make sure that they do things in a right way, that they are going to be set up through the Constitution with a body authorized to manage that budget. And they get to elect their people there and also ensure that there's oversight for them through the official auditing process. Additionally, they want to have a say. They say too many times decisions are made that affect them and their livelihoods and they have no say. They want a process that they can have a say and not just an optional say, that it is something mandatory, that they have to have regular consultations with them, not at just the Tobago House of Assembly level, but even at the level of central government. They want to make sure that across the island that they are treated equitably. And therefore, they don't see a crown point being developed much faster than a Roxborough or, you know, um, Mount St. George or another community. And that there's equitable support given to them. Now, this can be done, and I'm happy to hear people bring it forward, that if we have a colonial constitution, then what does that say about our government? And therefore, all of those concerns deserve a new design of the government. A new design that does not just deal with government and parliament, but also brings the communities into another level of the governance structure to ensure that they can you know, deal with their needs and to actually bring them into the conversation. And what you're also looking at in order to do that is to have an elected Senate, an elected Senate that has direct responsibilities for the who, those who were elected for, because right now the appointed Senate, you know, whoever pays, what they say, whoever pays the piper, plays it, calls the tune, okay? So if you have an elected Senate, then the people will be calling the tune. That elected Senate must have specific responsibilities, specific responsibilities towards the spatial allocation of resources throughout those communities. And I think uh, Dr. James has put forward even a scientific formula, a scientific formula that works with making sure we define all communities, their boundaries, mapping their assets, and using a formula with the number of people in your area with the uh, resources that they produce in order to be able to determine the, you know, how much should be given to each area. But the Senate also should be provided with oversight committees to oversight the usage um, within the government, okay? And to ensure that the communities are also utilizing those funds and in the way in which they are utilizing them. The House of Representatives ought to have a, ought to have a limited executive. Limited executive, so there's appropriate oversight over the executive. Right now, across the, the country, we have two governing bodies where there's absolutely no oversight and runaway administrations. Okay, And therefore, designing the government such that you don't have everyone who is elected in a post 
but you have someone, some of them elected will go into administration, the rest stay in parliament to do the people's work, to provide the laws and to do the necessary oversight of the executive. The time has come for that. And I see my uh, uh, <laughs> moderator here is standing, so I don't know if I'm supposed to sit and come back. Yes, I can sit and come back. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the contribution and we continue to the microphone. All right, so just before we continue, go ahead, Dr. Farah. Uh, and uh, I, just, I just wanted to um, intervene because I think, I think we've had two very uh, interesting interventions, Mr. Joe Field and, 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 and Denise, very interesting. Um, more than interesting, I think very, um, I, I just want to say to both of you that I agree with you entirely. I agree with everything Mr. Joe Field said. But I want to tell you that nobody here at this head table and our colleagues, we are not naive. We're not stupid. We live here too. I am 71 years old. I have seen the politics in this country. I know it. I know them. I know them very well. Mr. Sinanan was the Speaker of the House. He knew them too. Mr. Mohammed, he know them too. We're not stupid. But if, if, this, if this is a political ruse, as you called it, very lovely word, or political gimmick, as Denise called it, 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 is, it may be. But what I would say is that it is an opportunity. It might be a ruse or a gimmick for the Prime Minister and the government, but it is an opportunity for the people. And you, Mr. Joe Field, you said something very important. You said, we here have to do something different. Because you see, it is not about us here. It is about you all. It is the people of Trinidad and Tobago who is going to make this happen, you know. I am very clear about that. Let me make it absolutely clear. It is not about this committee. We are not going to make anything happen. It is for the people of Trinidad and Tobago to make it happen. And the people, you see, the, the, the other thing that I'm saying in my mind, I, I, I'm an economist before I'm a lawyer. And where this country is going from an economic point of view is not good. We are running out of time. We are running out of runway. Look at the numbers. Look at where our natural gas production is going. Trinidad and Tobago's oil production today, our oil production peaked in 1978, 225,000 barrels a day. We are now down to less than 50,000 barrels a day. We used to be called an oil economy. Our gas production was 4.2 BCF a day. We are now down to less than 3 BCF a day and falling. And that is why the scramble for dragon gas and so on is taking place now. We are running out of time, we are running out of resources. And so, and, 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 and they sort of take that with the other point about our colonial constitution. Because what that is saying, and to talk to my friend um, who asked the question, what does that mean? In a, in a colonial constitution, what you have is a monarch, a king, and subjects, not citizens subjects. And we have to decide whether we are subjects or whether we are citizens. That's the decision that we have to make. And it is not for this committee. We see ourselves as creating for the people of Trinidad and Tobago an opportunity. Carpe diem. Seize the time. This is the fifth time seize the time. It is not for us, it is for you said it. We here have to do something different. Because if we don't do something different, somebody is going to do something different to us. And the other thing I say to people outside there is that 1990 happened. And everybody here who is old enough can remember where you were and what you did on July the 27th, 1990. Because all of us were shocked out of our wits 
and we're asking ourselves, how could this have happened? Right? But it happened. The next time it happens, it is not going to be like 1990. But the difference is that they have plenty young men outside there with plenty big, big guns. So it's not going to be like 1990. 1990 was five days, it finished, the army stepped in. The next time it happens here could be very different and very disastrous. People, carpe diem. See, we here, we're not stupid. We are presenting you with an opportunity. It's not for this committee. We are going to, we are going to put something forward to the government, and it's going to reflect the views that we are hearing from the population. Everything that we have heard here tonight, we are getting from the 800 submissions that we are getting from the people outside there. We are getting from the town halls all over the country. So people know the, the time is here, and it is for you all <laughs> now. It is for you, not for us. We're going to make, we're going to, we're going to help create the opportunity for you, but it's for you all to seize the time. So that's what I want to say, Chairman. Thank you very much there, Dr. Terence Farrell, for the contribution, and we continue from the audience. Please proceed. Yes, good night to the head table. A strange table to me, except for Mr. Ray Sandy, a most esteemed just gentleman that I know. I don't know the rest, but just Just night. a reminder to start yes. with your name and the general area yeah, from which you're yeah. coming from. Yeah, yeah. Caleb Philip Bacolet. I have uh, some concerns concerning the, 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 this constitution reform. Yeah. Where does the Tobago House of Assembly fall in all this? We have a number of matters in Tobago that we want to be, that we want to look at them seriously, or we have been looking at them seriously, but they can only be authorized. The correction of those, or the adjustment of those, can only be authorized by the parliament. One of them is the Tobago land title issue. Newspaper article October 12, 2020. The then auto Attorney General, Mr. Faris Alwari, both stood and talked a lot about how Tobago land titles could be corrected and how through different laws and different forums this could be done. To the last time I checked, nothing has been done. And for the 21 years of the PNM in Tobago, Nothing about the autonomy bill to even have these things done was advanced. They didn't advance the bill in 21 years, not one inch. The parliament under this government should be a stepping stone to THA's success. But to many of the, on the island, it is a stumbling block because there are a lot of overriding powers in going on in Tobago here. Matters that fall under the THA the central government personnel is coming to do it here, imposing the authority because they're strong from the parliament. And this is one of the things in Tobago that I have a problem with. Act 40 of 1996, and somebody could correct me, that businesses operating in Tobago, that their taxes and revenue should be paid into the THA fund. That is to help complement the meager 4% that we are getting on the island. So from 1996 to now, those taxes, like from insurance companies, car companies, um, the business companies, all those companies, those taxes have been paying into the consolidated fund, which is the government's bank account. So we want an audit from 1996 to now of the money that should have been paid in the THA's account and be paid to the government. We don't worry money seep out. To many in Tobago, the government is still robbing the THA and robbing Tobagonians. And there is an opinion on this island that a fig that's supposed to be shared between Trinidad and Tobago should be shared in a reasonable way 
but it is shared in this way. Trinidad eats the fig and throws the skin for Tobago. So it is like a game we used to play, send the fool a little further, because this forum here tonight, I'm not sure if to take it serious or not to take it serious. We are clamoring for changes on the island, and we're not getting it at all, but yet we have a forum com coming around saying about constitution reform. We don't want to disrespect anybody, because when you look at the situation between Trinidad and Tobago, a borough could make a law, you know, from what I understand, I stand to be corrected, I say. A borough could make a law, and have it sent to the president and send it into law. That is why you can have borough police. The, you can't have a Tobago House of Assembly police just so, except the parliament approves it. The parliament must approve any such thing. Although Mr. Manning, in 2007 newspaper article, I have the papers, say that Tobago could have that, but they have to look at it properly. THA can't do that. So we want reform, and we want this body that come here tonight to have an audience with the THA executive. Those are our representatives on the island. I saw a clip from Dr. Keith Rowley which says, I stay out of Tobago people's business. Tobago's business is run by the Tobago House of Assembly. So I am saying that this panel here tonight should have a meeting with the executive of the Tobago House of Assembly. Another concern again, my brothers and sisters, is the property tax. Tobago is not being dealt with fairly at many levels across Trinidad and Tobago. You have a property tax in Tobago. I don't know for most of you who may know or may not know. Every traveling officer in Tobago gets sea blast allowance, regardless of what part of Tobago you're living. And that sea blast allowance is because the sea blast is eaten away a car. I don't know of anybody with a house, with a car parked up in a yard, that the sea blast come and say, I won't eat in the car, you know, me troubling the AC, and I troubling the fence, and I troubling the roofing. So that to, eat, to, be, to maintain a house in Tobago is much more expensive than to maintain that house in Trinidad because of the sea blast allowance here. Cost of material. Some of the material in, in Tobago is about 50% more than you buy it in Trinidad. Because the Tobago House of Assembly, we, we in Tobago still have to go down to Trinidad, buy the material, and bring it up here. And there are many hassles in getting the material here. The boat is one of the problems. And when the boat don't run there, they rush to get things done here, and so that we are not happy with. I, I welcome the panel that come here for, the, for the, the constitution reform, but I'm saying, brothers and sisters, you all need to have a conversation with the Tobago House of Assembly. The central government, the prime minister, and his cabinet cannot avoid the assembly if you're dealing with Tobago. You can't choose not to deal with the assembly in this matter. So me five minutes must be coming to an end. About two more seconds. So I say, brothers and sisters, Tobago should be exempted from property tax or have a reduced property tax because of our condition on this island here. And the property tax collected in San Fernando, the property tax collected in Chaguanas is to fix Chaguanas people business, and it's so correct. But the property tax collected in Tobago is to send to Trinidad to fix Trinidad business, and that is not fair to Tobago. That is not fair to Tobago, and we have to look into that. We have to look into that. That is not fair to Tobago. The crime rate again, brothers and sisters. Something has to be done, because Tobago is constantly being contaminated by Trinidad, where crime is concerned. You don't have a jail in Tobago. You have a hole in Bay maybe for a day or so. You take a fellow on an obscene language charge, or on a child maintenance charge. You send him down to Trinidad for two weeks, he come back up a seasoned criminal. We have to be careful of these things. A jail is a university, you know? That is why when a government overthrew, when rebels overthrew a country, the army is not allowed to speak to them because they may convince the army. It's not dunce fellows, you know? The prison is not a place of dunce people, eh? So when you take your fellow, your, your brother, your sister, in some little crime, and you send them down to Trinidad to spend a month 
and he said he was went down to jail for a month. Uh -huh. If you have a month, a problem coming up to meet you. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for the contribution. Let's hear from the committee chair. Mr. Philip, you have actually read our mind. Just this afternoon, the point you were raising about meeting with the THA, we discussed us and we discussed that, and hopefully in within the next two weeks we'll be doing just that. Good evening to the head table and fellow Tobigonians. My name is Marlon Rajman. I'm from the Goodwood area. It is my considered opinion that items under the fifth schedule of the THA Act should be enshrined in the Constitution to avoid the apparent overreach of central government in the, in the areas that Tobago has the authority, whether by setting up a Ministry of Tobago Development or social development ministry trying to run programs in Tobago. If it was illegal then, if it was disrespect then, it certainly is disrespect now. Tobago is approximately 5.8% of the country of Trinidad and Tobago. It is also my considered opinion that no less than 5.8% of the budget, the development budget, be allocated to Tobago for Tobago's development. Joint select committees and other committees set up by the parliament, I think they should be chaired by an independent senator and have equal amounts of government and opposition members so that there isn't any apparent bias. Can we explore the possibility of having at least one senator appointed by the Tobago House of Assembly to represent the views and interests of Tobagonians, regardless of who runs the government in Trinidad? And we, the people, believe that we have come of age in 2024 and that we would certainly like to have a say in the selection or election of our president. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the contribution and we continue. Good night everyone. My name is Jolie St. John and I would quickly like to make two points as a youth in Tobago, more specifically a person under the age of 18. Firstly, I do believe some form of advocation, something should be done for youth entrepreneurship, not just on the island, but in Trinidad and Tobago on a whole. And consideration does need to be given for persons like myself under the age of 18. Um, for example, I would have gone on the venture of starting my business at the age of nine, but it was a challenge to register my business under my name. So I do think something should be done um, for that. We do see where the National Youth Awards, the category of entrepreneurship, um, was altered to include awardees from the age 10 to 15, but on record, you are not able to have your business under your name. Secondly, I do believe that with the Tobago autonomy that we are advocating for, there should be some inclusion of education reform in the sense that we need to be more accommodating of learners who are at different levels be it special education for persons with learning impediments, whether it is academic programs for persons who are more advanced or programs for persons who are students who are below average. Because being a current secondary school student, I can say that the current schooling system is not very much beneficial to everybody to have everyone mixed up in one classroom with one teacher who has a specific teaching style who may not know that a particular child has a specific impediment or disability or who may be more advanced or below average and the school system does not provide for persons to be particularly helped with whatever need they have. But thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And while we wait for others to come to the mic, again, you'd forgive me if I take the time out to quickly recognize Deborah Mata that spoke earlier is actually our top C student in that time, probably just about seven or eight years ago. And Julie St. John, I think just about two years ago or so. 
three years ago, our top C student. Let's make some noise for our young persons making contributions here this evening. All right, so we continue. Okay. Hi. Um, it's me, Aaron Amata again from Mount Grace. See? So I have a bit of a laundry list. So I'm going to try and get through everything as quickly as I possibly can. So the first thing I want to speak to is um, as th this um, individual in the back there had spoken about in regards to, so she spoke a, a bit, well, her, most of her sp speech, I rem remember, I remember, focused on like women's rights and such. And I wanted to talk about one of the comments that she made um, about the difficulty of getting one's tubes, tubes tied, which is, well, one, I would like to say as a person who got their tubes removed after one very quick and casual conversation with a wonderful doctor in Trinidad, that um, it's something I had been looking into in seeing like, what's the feasibility of getting this done publicly, like um, through public hospitals and such like that. And from what I've read from the Ministry of Health um, site, and from speaking to some government ministers, you actually, like on the books, on paper, you aren't required to get permission from your husband or your boyfriend, whoever. Like, in fact, it's advised against that you would have to receive that permission. But I'm more than certain there are people, there are people who have tried to get their tubes tied and been told by the practitioners, oh no, you, we need this permission and that permission. And that just goes into, and I've had other like discussions where I'm confronting government officials, and I'm like, why is this allowed? Or why is that allowed? Why are the police telling me this? Da -da 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 -da. And they're like, actually, that's not supposed to happen. So there's a lot of like laws and rights that we have on the books that are not being executed on or upheld by the public service members. So it's the nurses who are letting us down, it's the police who are letting us down. And we as individual citizens either don't know our rights or don't really have well-known pathways to have that addressed. And so I just wanted to speak to that. I also want to speak, she spoke about the femicide rate and something I want to talk about as well was, I think that a lot of, that we need to um, ensure that there's training given to like government ministers or teachers or anybody who is allowed to act in a teaching or educational capacity to young individuals that focuses on making sure this person doesn't promote harmful, bigoted values and beliefs. I recently did an internship with the THA and one of our, and something I would notice that would happen, a lot of our guest speakers were men and they would allow misogynistic discussions to run rampant in the classrooms and just encourage certain ideas. And I was like, wow, you don't know any better. <laughs> like, I don't think you personally actively hate women, but you're allowing for these misogynistic conversations to happen and to like boil and fester and you're encouraging this in the youth. And then it's like, why are we killing women? And it's like, because men don't, because people don't respect women and women's lives. So I think if we could have some sort of like educational policy for anybody who is allowed to interact with the youth or teach the youth, I think that'd be very important. Um, Darian, Mr. Mitchell spoke about how individuals who don't have internet access or have regular internet access mightn't have been able to find out about this meeting. And I completely agree with that. And something I was thinking about is in this day and age, something like electricity, the right to a smart device, and the right to having internet is incredibly crucial and incredibly important. And perhaps it's, I, I hear different countries talk about considering it, and I think maybe we should look at internet access as a human right the way we consider like water a human right maybe not as exactly important but getting up there because it's pivotal in a lot of the things that we're doing and speaking to that even more i think on a whole the i do not like tourism and i think it is very no no <laughs> but I'm, I'm not I'm not a big fan of tourism because I'm not really a, a big fan of like all the institute like we're talking about oh the colonialism of the this and of that and I think 
when you make yourself a tourist nation, then what we're doing is making ourselves dependent on the people with the highest, highest, highest purchasing power, which happens to be a certain demographic of people. And I think that, so one, we're making ourselves a tourist economy, and two, we're not doing tourism well anyway, and so we're just not a good economy. And I know that we have like actual upstanding economists here, but I think that um, as a republic, as an island, as Tobago, we put too many of our eggs in the basket of tourism, and I wish that we would try and focus on different sectors. I would like if we could focus on some sort of self-sufficiency. We're a small island, so there's only so much we can do by ourselves. We have to be reliant on our neighboring countries and stuff like that. But it's like, the Cabo Star can't come in because we have a cruise ship docked. I wonder what that's about. And then I can't buy water, you know? Like all of the, like there was a night when every store I went to, there was just no way to get a big bottle of water. Cause it was like, well, the, the, we didn't get it in from Trinidad. We don't get this from Trinidad. So we just have to sit down and starve. <laughs> and I just think there's some sort of self-sufficiency that we need to start promoting. Um, and doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, and the other thing that I wanted to speak about when I th think about this form that we're in right now is that I, there's a lot of forums that I've participated in where they're like, hey, can you come and give us your opinion, please? And I think those are very valuable, but something that happens is that I would go to those forums and I'm like, to be honest, I only half know what I want to say, and I wish that we did like educational outreach, and then like a couple months later, then you have the form of inquisition. So like, come and talk to me and chat to me. Let me have legal advisors that I can discuss things with and get a better understanding of things. And then come back in a couple of months and say, okay, well, what would you like to see? What would you like to know? Because I, I don't know that much and I don't know what I need to, to um, be focused on. So I would love to see that more. Um, the last thing I wanna mention is that somebody earlier was talking about how slow Everything moves, you try to get anything done, and it's just so much bureaucracy and stuff like that. And I don't know why it happens, but I wish there would be a way for things to happen faster, especially when it comes down to things like legal proceedings. Thank you so much for your time. All right, thank you very much. All right, as we're getting down to the final segment, we just want to remind persons we're going to try to keep very tight uh, with that time frame as the contributions come forward. Please proceed. All right, good night again, everyone. One of the, well, I am Shakir from Providence again. One of the points I forgot to mention <coughs> previously was NIS and the contributions. I would really like to recommend bringing attention and the need for a thorough investigation on NIS contributions, mainly due to my observations of inconsistencies and bad practices. So recently upon my departure from a company, I would have requested reports, a report of my contributions. And I found a discrepancy because after two years, nothing has been contributed for me. Despite taking responsibility for not being a bit more vigilant, it's concerning that such oversights occurred, especially when the employers create a, a front of compliance and a caring nature knowing that this is being done behind your back. I think we need to investigate that a bit more. And when complaints are being made at the NIS office, it takes months, 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 months for the situation to be assessed. And it can be daunting and can deter your motivation to pursue the matter. And most persons would just forget about it. And it's basically a win for the wrongdoers. Also, I know we'd have preached about um, self-employment and owning businesses and stuff, but there is a lot of barriers to accessing business loans, setting up business accounts in Trinidad and Tobago. And it can be quite daunting, especially considering the, the emphasis on entrepreneurship and the message being spread to the youths to be innovators and entrepreneurs. The lengthy process and cumbersome requirements can deter aspiring entrepreneurs from pushing their visions despite having the necessary qualifications and skills. 
I do think it's essential for the government and financial institution to streamline these procedures and provide more support to facilitate the growth of small businesses and encourage entrepreneurship in the country. All right, thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, so at this point, as we draw nearer to the close off of the session, we want to remind persons as, of course, create that opportunity, particularly if you have not contributed as yet, but you would hope to make a contribution here uh, this evening before the session ends. So let's go to the next contributor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good, good evening to the head table. And I see Mr. Sandy representing Tobago. So there is Sandy, and that's Miss, um, Mrs. Miguel. Okay, Alan, nice to have you in Tobago. When you go back, tell Alan Richard said hello. My lecturer from the university, Mr. Farrell, and Mr. Sinanan, Barry Sinanan from the parliament. All right, I, I'm going to get straight to the, oh, name, Anselm Richards. I'm from Tobago, Bell Garden, and now I'm residing at can be. So there's a little internal migration to this part of the island. So, so I'm going to get straight to the, um, to the fact of the matter. I know that, and Mr. Farrell said it, that we have a, con a colonial constitution. And it is more colonial in, re in relationship to Tobago. I don't know if we're going to get the constitution fixed the way it ought to be fixed, because I think that significant errors was made in 1962 when this constitution was put together. And it's about how many years now we're trying to rectify those errors. But I'm going to go to the heart of the problem that concerns Tobago and Tobagonians, because those are my constituency. And I'm saying that there are some significant changes that we are looking at for the constitution to create a more equitable country as it relates to Trinidad and Tobago. And I think one of the things we have to recognize is that Tobago's right to self-determination was appropriated away from Tobago when the Constitution was put together. And therefore, we are not asking for Port of Spain or the Parliament to grant us internal self-government. We are asking for a right to internal self-determination to, self to be restored. Because there's a thing called island rights and a people's right to self-determination. And there's also a, a, a convention and a philosophy that a when a, a, a society is more stable, when a people is governed by their own laws. So having said that, I think there are some straight recommendations I'm, I'm going to make because the Constitution as it is, I think that we have to make an amendment to Section 52 of the Constitution that creates the Parliament to create the Tobago legislature and give it law-making authority for the matters for which Tobago is responsible. And we can say the fifth schedule matters as a starter. Two. We have to make an amendment to Section 75 of the Constitution that creates the cabinet, which is really the monarch, and break the monarch into a government and as it relates to Tobago and give Tobago its executive authority unfettered for the matters that it is responsible for and put a feather between the cabinet and the Tobago executive. That's, one. That, that's the second one. Two. We have to have a clear consti constitutional definition of the country that is Trinidad and Tobago and the, country that is to, and the part of the country that is Tobago and the part that is Trinidad for administrative and legal matters. So when, when Tobago legislator makes a law, we know where the law applies and the jurisdiction of the law. When the Trinidad parliament makes a law for the matters of crime and that is in Trinidad, we know where that applies. And then we have, we have probably federal laws, if you want to call it that. The other point I will make is that in terms of the revenue distribution, I think that the, there should be an amendment, I think it's section 113 of the Constitution that creates for the appropriation bill. 
I think that we can't leave as what obtains now. Tobago's allocation from the National Post is the subject of the DRC, and the DRC ruling had provided some conditionality for it to be reviewed and updated, and, and it was, the 4.0 tree was based on the population at the time, and the 6.9 was based on those defaults or those conditionality that needs to be um, upgraded in Tobago in terms of the state of the economy. But since the DRC, we have been fed at the lowest end of, of, of that decision, 4.03 on average. But since the DRC ruling 20 something years ago, Tobago population have grown to nearly 6%. Right? And the point is, the lower end of the DRC ruling was based on the population. So since 2011, Tobago should have been gotten five plus percent of the national budget. So I'm making that point to say that section 30, 113 of the constitution should be amended to give Tobago a share, a fair share of the national budget. I wouldn't quote a percentage, but if the budget comes at 100 billion, Tobago, if it's 10%, Tobago get its 10%. And the Tobago government will decide how we apply the $10 billion in terms of Tobago's priority needs for development. What happens now, you submit a budget to the central government and the Minister of Finance without consultation applies how the money should be spent in Tobago. Although the THA has some jurisdiction to reallocate money, but he applies without consultation with the Executive Council as to how and what things should be funded or not be funded in the THA budget when you send a budget to Port of Spain, which really speaks to the whole issue of colonization. So the, the colonial master in Port of Spain decides how Tobago should go forward. So those, those are the, some of the basic requirements. We also need to have, if we are talking about, and we're going back to the argument or the conversation of a, federal, a system, a governance system for Trinidad and Tobago, that recognizes equity. In the United States, the Senate is the legislative body that brings equity to the states. Each state has two senators. So that is where the, the, the equity comes in. And then at the House, you have different district representation. If we have to bring a federal government, then there has to be a legislature that brings a balance to Tobago and a balance to Trinidad. I don't know the formula, I'm just saying on the principle of equity, we could work it out. It doesn't have to be the hardcore federal system, but some things that bring justice, fairness to the people of Trinidad, fairness to the people of Tobago, and fairness to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So it's three, three levels of consideration that needs to take place in that conversation. My colleague Barry Jofield spoke to the issue of the semi-executive president in Singapore. It's something that the committee can pay some attention to, to break some of the power that the monarch has in Port of Spain. And give it to the president, we elect a president, you're in charge of the army, the police, so when we are investigating politicians, they can't stop because the president has oversight and control over those law enforcement agency and the prime minister runs the government of the day and the heritage and stabilization fund can go to the president too so the government can draw down as they want they meet certain conditions they apply to the president so there are different models we can use but for today for to be good today we need our right to self-determination and we need the constitution and that will take care of the Tobago bills in parliament those are the things we need we need lawmaking powers and the Prime Minister knows that the heart of the constitutional reform and the internal self-government struggle for Tobago is the right to make law. You remember when he had the little tit and tat with the Prime Minister, with the Chief Secretary in his press conference? He said, I can't make law. Because if a people cannot make law to give effect, because law is the instrument or the mechanism that give life and meaning and materialism to policy. So you have executive authority to make policy, but you can't make the law to give effect to them. 
So that is the heart of the argument, and that's my submission. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you very much there. And we're only able at this point to take one more contribution. All right. So we'll have to take the one who hasn't contributed for the evening. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Can I be fair just to make two points and give Mr. Brendan Gray the next two? Well, one so minute is already short. gone, eh? so okay. speak for two and then he could get you extra two. <laughs> All right, thank you. Good night, everyone. Mr. Um, Eric Williams is the name. And I think it's only fair that seeing that the founding father of Mr. Williams, I should make a point. We all don't know the end result. However, the federal system I support. However, with all fairness to the Trinidadians who may think that we may want to do things Trinidad and Tobago, we can look at the idea of probably splitting Trinidad as well. So you have the south and southern area, you have the northern area and so forth. So the federal system can expand to that as opposed to just having Trinidad and Tobago. That's my point, and I give Mr. Brendan Gray my other. All right. So, no, Mr. Gray, you're only able to have two seats. Either you're giving it to her or you are speaking. <laughs> because we have got to close off at this point. Yeah, we are here practicing to make sure that this constitution is going to go somewhere. So, he's going to speak, and then I will speak after. No, no, there's only two minutes. <laughs> Good night, myself, my, my head table, and everyone, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Brendan Gray, um, Scarborough. Yeah. Um, I just want to commend uh, my friend, um, Mr. Doc is Dr. Richards. Is Dr. Richards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and Dr. James, my friend. But what I want to speak about, I hear he's, he's, he's asked about the... Um, distribution, the sharing in, of resources um, by the, both the island, the country, on the basis of um, the budget. My thing is, if we look, and he made mention about the distribution, the boundaries of the both islands, and the resources within those boundaries of the islands. If we look at those resources and share them in a reasonable, practical way, we have no need to send a budget to Trinidad. Because in the boundaries would be resources in them. I have a, I have a, I have a map. This map, I think, went down to, to Trinidad with the submission by Dr. by Mr. London, over London. I think it went in his package, suggesting that the boundaries are Tobago and the boundaries are Trinidad. Yes? So that if we take this map, and look at the resources within it and have it distributed between the islands in a reasonable way. As an old, as an elder once said to me, he said, uh, you know, you have uh, two sisters living together. Both have uh, um, an acre each, and they live in next to one another. And one has Julie Mango on her property, and the other one has um, <laughs> starch mango so, so Mr. Gray, on their to, property. I have not to interrupt anybody else. Yeah, it's evening, important I say this. No, I know it is important, Yes, but there's also a time frame allotted. Yes. All right? So I just want you to, you know, just in move on. Yes. seconds. Yes. I to, want to yes. make sure I'm saying it right. Okay? And if one of the sisters has 12 children and the other one has three, but they both love Ma Julie Mango and starch mango how would they share the both types of mango 
based on the value of the family. It got to be shared reasonably. And not only reasonable for the family that exists, but with the families to come. So there must be a particular formula they will attract in order to share both the Julie mango and the starch mango. So the formula need to be adopted in order to share the resources of each acre of property. That is how I see the situation that exists between Trinidad and Tobago. And there's no need for us sending a budget down to Trinidad if we are allowed to share the resources within each territory or each boundary of each island. It will be then done automatically even for the heritage of the, the, the family or the people to come based on that fact. So I'm saying, ladies All and right, gentlemen, so we need that kind of approach also to be adopted and also to take into consideration the Heritage and Stabilization Fund of both islands. It then places that in a context that is reasonable for each island to adopt. All thank right. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. And let me thank all the other contributors this evening. No, you, no, you will have an opportunity after this session, but at this point I'm required to move along uh, because of the time constraint. So let me just invite uh, uh, Mr. Ray Sandy, member of the committee, to close us off. You will have a moment after the event that you can mingle and interact with the members of the committee. So let me give a round of applause for all the contributors this evening. The pleasure is mine to do the vote of thanks. So first let me thank each and every one of you who attended. And we certainly um, took cognizance of what was said this evening or, or, or tonight. And we understand what our role is. And we will do justice to the, the instruction that we were given. So we really thank you for the input that you have um, allowed us to, um, to listen to tonight. I also want to thank the, um, the, the, the person that um, the Tobago House of Assembly who assisted us in, um, in putting together the, the, the venue. And thanks to, the, to the, chief the chief administrator and the people at the um, Shaw Park um, facility here, the cultural facility here, in accommodating us. We also want to thank um, the Central Administration Services, um, CAS, for providing us with some um, logistical um, support and all of that else this would not have um, come off at all in Tobago. So we really want to thank each and everyone who contributed to having a very successful evening here. And I must say that um, the, the turnout was good compared to some of the other turnouts that we have been having in Trinidad. So this was an excellent turnout. And of course, the, the discourse was very enlightening, notwithstanding um, we had some, some young persons, some elder persons, and some, but every contribution was significant, and we really appreciated the fact that you came out here and you spoke your mind. As Dr. Farrell indicated, uh, we, are, we are not, um, uh, we're, not, we're, not, we're, not we're not insensitive to the, um, to the task that we, are, we, are, we, are, we have here, and we know exactly what we need to do. We are given instruction, but we're going we're gonna, to um, fashion the instruction in a particular kind of way so that our, our time here isn't, um, isn't wasted. We know it's the sixth or the seventh um, time that this constitutional thing came up, but we, we, we expect that this would be the last one of them all. <laughs> right? So again, let me thank you all very much because I have some colleagues here who have to leave because of flights. Flight. You know, the flights don't go on until 2 o'clock in the morning anymore. At 10 o'clock, the last flight, and so on and so on. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go down that road, but, <laughs> but thank, thanks for coming, and um, and we really appreciate the um, the support, and all the all the audiovisual people, the camera persons, the persons from the um, THA uh, in, information department, we really appreciate the kind of support that you would have given to us. So thank you very much, and do have a good night. Thank you, thank you, and I just want to say that in order for us to make laws in Tobago.